So, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this day of joy, because it's the thir 30th birthday of the IBM PC, so that's what we're here for. No, actually not. So, we are going to talk about moon bounce communication, but not only moon bounce, but radio communication through space, through very long distances, and of course, to the moon. So, let's start. Yeah. Moon bounce is, of course, uh, very simple. There is a very simple explanation for moon bounce. You have a radio signal, you transmit it towards the moon, you get the reflection back from the moon, which is just there hanging in the sky, and you try to, to receive that signal again, or maybe another station on the Earth. The first uh, attempts to do this were done in the mid-1940s by the US Army Signal Corps. So, and what they wanted to, to achieve with that is, of course, to send a signal through the moon to another station on Earth without uh, having to worry about all the weather, radio propagation conditions, and without the Russians listening in, which is, of course, not so easy because they can also see the moon. Yeah, only a few years later, they invented a better way, which is uh, just using satellites, telecommunication satellites for military, civilian use. So moon bounce was quite soon thereafter phased out for uh, commercial use, but radio amateurs only a few year after, years after started to do this as well. It's still done today. It's very demanding. It's really um, hard to do that for in comparison to a lot of uh, amateur radio things you can try. But it's, of course, fun. So this is what we do. Yeah. We, of course, start with some basics. A lot of you may know uh, the basic radio stuff, but we have to do some, some ground. Everyone is on the same level. It's very, very easy. It's nothing complicated, so you will be able to understand it. Yeah, this is also radio communication, so don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, we'll come to that very soon. So, this is just a quick overview of the radio uh, frequency spectrum. We start, of course, with very low frequency over there. Uh, which is not so much interesting, except you want to communicate with a nuclear submarine underwater. But if you go to, to about this, this uh, area, there is AM radio. Maybe you have uh, switched your car radio to AM for, for a mistake and wondered what's there. It's about here. Very long wavelengths, low frequencies, and a couple hundred kilohertz. This is, more ex uh, this is where amateur radios usually operate, shortwave frequency. There are also some shortwave radio stations. Not so interesting for moon bounce, because the signal usually doesn't leave the Earth, so it, it stays within the ionosphere. Here it's more interesting, 100 megahertz. You might know that this is where your FM radio works, so it's much more interesting, and also these signals can leave Earth and travel into space. For moon bounce, you use signals from here upwards, so we, as you can see later, will be in this, this um, area as well. Quite far, uh, a bit farther up, uh, below 1 gigahertz and above 1 gigahertz, you have GSM radio, which you just heard. So. Signals travel line of sight. You don't have any wide uh, ranging communications there except with high power and if there's no obstacle in between, which would mean through space. So you can do that. Uh, communication satellites are in this area, 10 gigahertz. It's very good to reach the, the space through the atmosphere, which doesn't uh, disturb it too much except when it's raining. Oh, yeah. And further up, there is nothing more, much more interesting. You have, would have the naked scanners in this area, which they want to set up on on airports all around the world, and here is, of course, visible light. So this is just uh, a quick overview, and remember, we are working in more or less this. Here in the camp, we work in this range, and this is actually the, the frequency range you use for moon bounds and satellite communications, so communications through space. Please, the next slide. It's still early, so just don't worry. We are sleepy as well. Okay, there is a second basic we have to know. This is the decibel. Decibel is a unit, actually it's a ratio unit, so it's nothing fixed. You can say this has five decibel. This is just a ratio that we need, and you will see why we need that for comparison. So just you have to remember three decibel means doubling of power, minus three means half the power, 10 decibel means 10 times the power, minus 10 means just a tenth of the power, 20 would be 100 times the power, that's it. The very good thing is why we use that, because if you have very, very uh, big ranges of power, power, you can just easily add them and or subtract them. You don't have to multiply anything. There are no sub not that big numbers involved. So this is where we like to use the decibel. And we will even have a 
very, very simple example to show that. So if you want to have uh, a set value, so not the comparative value, you use something like dBm. dBm is just a decibel um, compared to milliwatt. So zero dBm would be one milliwatt of power. Three dBm would be two milliwatts of power. 10 dBm would be 10 milliwatts of power. So it's quite easy to, to calculate. Next slide, please. OK. So we want to reach the moon, as we said. It's quite far away. Actually, it's about 380,000 kilometers in average. It's a little bit closer or farther away sometimes of the year. So it's hard to reach it. You can see it, at least when it's up during the night, which is good. So you might be able to hit it with your radio signal, but it's still far away. So you have a lot of path loss. Actually, as I said, we use decibels. The path loss for moon signal to the signal path to the moon and back gives you about 250 decibels of loss. As you can see, minus 3 is half the power, minus 10 is the tenth of the power. So this is quite a very, very small number. Then there are different uh, obstacles to communicate for communication with the moon. The signal you transmit is polarized. So you have a linear polarization, might have a circular polarization. Usually, it travels to the ionosphere through the, inter through the interplanetary space and back again, and it will get uh, bent and it will get circulated. So you might be able, not be able to hear a signal because it's circulated 90 degrees, which gives a lot of, of uh, signal loss in receive. Nothing specific, uh, specific, but you have to know that. On the other hand, it's quite good if you're standing on the North Pole and another guy stands on the equator, you have 90 degrees um, polar polarization difference anyway, so that might help as well. And there is noise. So remember, we're talking about very, very low signals coming back. So every HF noise, like the, the power supply from your laptop, might really disturb that. So this or a Tesla coil. A Tesla coils are especially bad because they transmit on every frequency you can think of. Yeah, that's it. And the ionosphere, which is for our frequency is not a big problem, but we still have to remember that it's here. Next slide, please. Okay, as I promised, as I promised, a very simple just calculation. We think about we have a signal of 100 watts, which is just like a, a standard light bulb, a bright one, the ones that are not any available anymore in the European Union. So this would be equal equally to 50 dBm of signal power. Then we use, of course, a directional antenna. So you don't use an antenna that transmit all around with the same strength. So use a directional antenna, which might give you a nice gain of 16 dB. The good thing is you can just add that to the to the 50 dBm, so you get 66 dBm. Then there's the path loss, and 250 dB is actually quite a good average. We are around here. Of course, antennas work in receive as well. We have another gain, which is, of course, nice. So we come up with a signal that is minus 168 dBm, which is this number in milliwatt. It, it are 17 zeros after the comma, so it's not very strong. Try to power LED with that, you won't get very far. So yeah, that's really low power, but what can we do? Of course, we can just brute force it. We have more power. If you use 1,000 watts instead of 100, we have 10 dBs more, only minus 176. So hey, that's cool. Of course, we can have the structural attempt, which means you make big, you make big antennas with more gain. That's actually nice if you have a lot of space and a lot of money because it's even more expensive than a strong power amplifier. But it's cool, of course. Radio dishes work nice if they are like 50 meters wide. It's great. And there is the smart attempt, just doing it intelligently. It's like it's me, but I'm, yeah, like doing it intelligently. So use a clever communications protocol. What that means, I will explain in a min in a second. But remember, the signals are so low that we do have to do all of that to be successful. Next slide, Peter. Next slide, please. Okay, so what ca how can we uh, communicate by the moon? Remember, it's about sending a signal to the moon, reflecting back and talk, or communicate with another station on Earth. So we don't want to talk to the moon because there's no one there. We can, of course, try to talk with people. That does work. You need a lot of power. You have a, a, a very wide signal 
couple kilohertz in, in, in width, so the bandwidth is quite wide. You need strong signal, and as you can might expect, if it, there is a lot of noise, you might not be able to understand what the other guy or gal is talking about. So this is actually quite inefficient, but you can do it if you have the right equipment. Then you use digital nodes. It's all about digital nowadays, but not only nowadays, Morse code in from the 1860s is already a digital mode, which you can do encode and decode by hand and by with your brain, and this works much better. If you have a really good Morse code or a CW operator, you can hear more signals that are 12 decibels below the noise floor, and this is quite cool. I can't do that, but there are people who can. And there, of course, you have a computer, so it's much better. You can just type on your keyboard like you are in an IRC chat, use some, uh, some data transfer modes, like old things, this is just radio teletyping, packet networks, or this is what, where it's going to enter JT65. So this is actually the most advanced mode you can use for radio communication with the moon, and this is what we are going to do, and this is what we will explain to you and talk about. So there is an American physicist, Joe Taylor, K1JT, so, uh, who developed this, this um, JT65? But not only JT65, he's a really interesting guy, Nobel laureate in astrophysics. He is really one of the people who can just go to receiver and say, hey, we want to use your big dish there to make moon bounce, and they will let him. So they did this last year, and with their setup, a 300 meter dish, you can really do voice communication. You can almost uh, receive them with a uh, handset like this, you just need a little bit bigger antenna, but this could be done. <coughs> he wrote w uh, WSJT, Weak sig Signal Joe Taylor. It's a program suite, free, open source, available to every amateur radio and actually all people on Earth for weak signal digital communication. There are several digital modes in the program which you can use for whatever you want to do, but for immune bounds with JT65, and this is um, what we can. You can, with JT65, decode or hear signals that are even much um, lower be below the noise floor than with Morse communication, around 25 dB or even better. So next slide, please. So this is the Arecibo radio telescope, which you can use for transmission as well, if you like. So Joe Taylor did this last year. You don't have to use JT65, of course, for that. You can just talk and people will hear you but JT65 is much more cool. So, thanks, and now I will give the microphone to Clemens, which will, uh, who will just explain to you how JT65 works and why it is really cool. Yeah, are there any questions about the first stuff? We will have a Q&A later as well, but if you want to just uh, have a question right now, we can answer that, of course. Okay, Clemens. Okay, so um, the best thing you can do uh, about uh, um, modulation is okay. Is this better? Okay, so um, the easiest thing you can do to uh, create a modulation that's uh, getting really fast is, uh, well, uh, increasing the power. So if you have got the signal here, and so this is the frequency, and this is the amplitude of the signal. And like this is your uh, signal. It's, um, it's very wideband, so you have a very uh, low amplitude of the signal. So if you go to the next slide, this is a much better signal. There is not as many information in it uh, as in the big signal, but the amplitude is, uh, um, it's mu is much higher. And what we are actually doing is this. It's, a extremely, uh, it's an extremely narrow signal. Um, and the trick with it is that, uh, next slide. If you have a uh, noise floor that's like this high or much higher, uh, if your amplitude is high enough, you can still decode it. And yeah, that's exac exactly the same as uh, JT6, uh, 
65 is doing. So uh, 65 is for 65 tones. It's a frequency shift keying. And on two meters, we are using JT65B. Uh, two meters or 144 megahertz is the frequency we are transmitting and receiving. And it's uh, one tone at a time with a continuous amplitude that uh, makes it easier for uh, power amplifier designing and uh, receiving. So have you, you have got a constant tone that's only changing in the frequency. Uh, the bandwidth of the signal, uh, the maximum bandwidth of the signal is uh, 355 hertz, and the tone spacing is uh, 5.4 hertz. So the tones are really, really narrow. And um, every half time there's a pilot tone. So um, there's another thing. Uh, what uh, JT65 uh, is doing is it is a massive forward error correction. It's a Reed Solomon coder, and it can decode up to a minus 27 decibels under the noise level. If you have got something like uh, wireless uh, networks, you need about uh, 20 dBs uh, above the noise level to have a good signal. So that's really, really good. So. Um, uh, um, we are transmitting time synchronous, so uh, you are sending like uh, 47 seconds, and then there are um, 13 seconds left for decoding and user interaction with the program, and the other minute the other station is transmitting and you are receiving. So there, uh, uh, you can say it's one packet is about one, mil uh, one minute round trip time. And um, the, you are actually doing this with preferred text messages uh, that are really small and uh, that's, there's not much information in it. So we have got a few sound examples. Um, okay, uh, we will at first transmit a signal that's uh, 10 decibels above, above the noise level. So you can uh, clearly hear the tones. Uh, there's a signal that's uh, exactly on the noise level, so uh, zero decibels above the noise level. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was the wrong file. This is not what we heard from the moon. <laughs> so this is already a bit harder to understand. So uh, the next file is 10 decibels uh, under the noise level. So uh, you can guess the tones, but it's not really uh, decodable by your ear. And the next sound file is 20 decibels under the noise level. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can't hear any, anything but with a computer and the demodulation signal, it's very easy to decode it. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, that's a standard QSO. On the left side, we've got our station. That's Oscar Echo 5 X-ray Mike Lima. Uh, our, yeah, call sign, amateur radio call sign. And we have got the CQ on the left side that uh, we are looking for a station uh, to answer. Then uh, we, of course, we are, of course, uh, communicating with K1JT. So uh, he's answering that he heard us with his call sign. And so we are transmitting that uh, 
we heard him with our call sign and that we uh, decoded his message. And uh, that's just O, 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 so the signal is OK. The next thing uh, K1JT would transmit is uh, RO, like Roger. And uh, the last thing you need to, um, to end an earth moon earth communication is the Roger, Roger, Roger on the end. Uh, normally, you're, always, uh, you're also uh, transmitting uh, 73. That's like uh, greetings to the other station. So that would be a standard QSO over the moon. And um, if we had success, uh, we will see in the uh, delay, because it's also possible that we can uh, receive the signal over the uh, ionosphere uh, some object, but uh, there's, there's only one option uh, left when you have got uh, 2.4, uh, about 2.5 seconds delay of the signal, and that's the moon and back. So, for example, the distance Berlin Paris is about uh, three of a thousand seconds transmit time, so it's really a long round trip time to the moon and back. Uh, you can also do um, pings to the moon, it's like you're sending. Uh, as, as a short signal and trying to receive it for uh, with a station, and you can hear echoes from the moon. So about our setup, we are using two stacked uh, Yagi antennas with ten elements. Uh, they are about uh, five point no uh, six meters long each, and we are using linear polarization and. They have got uh, together 16 uh, dBi gain, so it's 16 dB over a perfect um, isotropic radiator. Um, you don't, uh, there's, you don't uh, for decoding the signal, uh, you need, of course, a um, transceiver, but also a very good uh, low noise amplifier. Um, we have got a low, low noise amplifier from Kuhne. That's a German um, yeah, company that's, uh, that, are, uh, that is producing really good super low noise amplifier with uh, over 28 decibels gain and about uh, 0 0.3 decibels of uh, internal noise. So that's really good. For transmitting, we have got a linear power amplifier with about uh, 750 watts, that's the maximum. Uh, that's the maximum we are legally allowed to transmit. So it's uh, quite good, but it's not enough if you want to do uh, mouse code over the moon. You need about uh, four times of that power to get mouse code over the moon to transmit and receive it. Um, yeah, for transmitting and receiving, we have got a really thick cable that's half an inch um, that's used for uh, GSM stations. And uh, so it's super low noise, uh, super low loss cable with about 0 0.2 decibels per meter at 6 gigahertz, with, which is really, really good. And yeah, as I already said, they are using it in GSM stations. They are also using uh, thicker cables, but that's the normal cable when you're going to a, a small or medium-sized antenna. Uh, and we're using a high-power coaxial relay uh, between the power amplifier and the low-noise amplifier because uh, the low-noise amplifier is very sensitive to incoming power. So uh, if you have got... Uh, um, a bad coaxial relay, you are just burning your low noise amplifier, and that was your moonbound section. So that's our setup. We've got the mast here, the two uh, antennas. They are combined over a power combiner, and here's the coaxial relay, whereas the low noise amplifier is, is directly connected to a coaxial relay. And, there, and then we are going with the thick cable to the power amplifier and a small uh, transmit uh, or receive coaxial relay that's just 
switching the receive and transmit path. Uh, yeah, that's our setup uh, this morning. We have uh, not fully finished it. Uh, it I hope, or we hope, uh, it will work in the evening or in the night. And yeah, mechanical things are already mostly done. Just a few cables. Uh, we have to we have to run just a few cables, and um, yeah, measure the antennas if everything is correct. So that was my part. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. So um, the moon is uh, it's these days. Uh, only up in the evening, so it rises at like uh, nine in the evening and sets like five or four, uh, six in the evening, uh, in the morning. So uh, you say, uh, what should we do in the rest of the time? Um, that's something very nice we can do. We can uh, talk to amateur radio satellites, or we can listen to any kind of, of satellites, but in fact, we like to, to listen to amateur radio satellites. Um, just for comparison, uh, 1957, the first satellite was launched, Sputnik. And in 1961, uh, already the first amateur radio satellite, the first non-government, non-commercial satellite, as far as I know, was launched. It was, um, um, since then, more than 70 satellite, radio, amateur radio satellites have been launched and are still working. The longest working satelli uh, uh, satellite now is uh, 35 years in service. It was kind of busted in between, but recently it, it started working again. So you see it's no matter of, of, of uh, high tech or something like that, it's uh, uh, things that work. Uh, it, these satellites are completely funded, built, and operated by the amateur radio communi community. And uh, as you see on the, on, the, on the number, it's now uh, by 12th of December, it's uh, 50 years that uh, this is happening all the time. So I think that's quite something. Just for the relations, uh, if you have here the Earth, low Earth, uh, low, um, low Earth orbits are from 300 kilometers to up to 2,000 kilometers. The ISS is now at uh, about 380 kilometers. The Hubble Space Telescope is about 570 kilometers. Uh, that's the area where most of the uh, amateur radio satellites are, and uh, which is easy to reach because you don't need so much energy, energy to get up. Uh, GPS is much higher at about 26 kilometers. Uh, geostationary satellites like uh, uh, TV satellites, Astra here, here in, in, in Germany and Austria is very popular. They are at 36 kilometer, uh, thousand kilometers. So uh, you might now uh, ask, and where's the moon? So this distance is uh, 36,000 kilometers. The moon is uh, 380,000 kilometers away. So look like 20 meters in this direction, and you have the moon. And it's in the size of like two hands. So you get the relation of uh, what we were talking before. So satel working satellites is much easier. Next slide. Uh, in fact, you don't need very much equipment. You can use something like. Uh, Momo amateur radio handheld and uh, home built antenna. I built this myself and it was not very difficult. But you can even use uh, a good depot antenna with your handheld. Uh, of course, you can do uh, with more power, more money, and you can have a, a station transceiver, a low noise amplifier as we had before to get stronger signals. Uh, you, can, you can put your antenna on a rotor and uh, turn your antenna from your warm uh, home, uh, not to get out in, in, in the winter or something like that. Uh, but very important, uh, you don't need much power. It's not the thing like uh, you have to blow uh, down this, this satellite. Uh, in fact, they are not very happy with uh, high power because they have low power. They have just some watts. Some sat satellites even work with uh, milliwatts of power, so if you put a strong signal up, uh, the satellite has to, to uh, respond to this signal with a strong signal, which, is, uh, which takes a lot of power, which is not favorable. 
Next slide. OK, what can you do with a satellite? You can do almost all modes, you know, from uh, terrestrial communication. You can do a double uh, CW. In fact, most of the satellites send beacons where they transmit their current state, like, uh, OK, I'm a little bit hungry, give me more sun, or uh, I feel a little bit cold, or I feel a little bit hot, or uh, I'm in, in a very happy state, or I'm in an emergency state. And of course, you can also do QSO over it. That's the amateur radio term for a communication. Uh, you can do single sideband. That's an amplitude modulation scheme, uh, which uh, is energy, more energy efficient. Uh, you can do a frequency modulation, which is the same on your, like on your, on your radio. Um, you can do all kinds of uh, digital modes, like uh, phase shift keying, which is very narrow band. Uh, all, all other uh, kind of, 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 of digital modes. Uh, you can do backhead radio, which is kind of uh, like modem uh, communication over. Hmm? Hmm? Okay, so. Click number of three forty. Okay. Technical problems. What is in the next folio? Not working anymore. Sorry. Can you see me from laughing? Um, and there are all uh, other. Um, yeah. There are other new modes like uh, last week. Uh, a satellite was launched out of the International Space Station. They just throw it out of the, of the window, or something like that, and it's, uh, it has interesting new uh, ways to receive. You can even receive it with a handheld radio and still code it. Next, next one. OK, um, how, can, how do you know where to find the satellite? Uh, these satellites are moving rather fast. They uh, rise and set within 10 minutes, something like that. So you have to know where to point your antenna. Uh, there's lots of software uh, on the internet for Windows, Mac, and of course for Linux. Uh, I prefer open source software. And my favorite is G-Predict by Alexandru Sete. He's, uh, he's a physicist uh, at, at, in, in, in Denmark. And uh, um, he, he, he's a very nice maintainer of this software. I already contributed a little bit, and it was uh, no pain. Yeah. Uh, so you see all the satellites, you see the, 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 um, the path they are traveling. It's a little bit hard to see. But for example, here you see one of the fam famous uh, amateur radio satellites. You see, where's the ISS? There has to be the ISS somewhere. Anyway, and here you see the point where we are, we are located. Now that's my hometown. And the area which the satellite would cover. So, if you are here at that spot and work over this satellite, you could reach a, a person like in this area. And I think that's quite something. Yeah, that's, that's quite a range. Um, short enough, keep reading. Uh, maybe can, we can show you a demonstration. Uh, ne never, never mind, we do it, we do it afterwards. So uh, you get here this, uh, this diagram, and you can, uh, you can look at where in the sky are, is the satellite now, and I just point my antenna in this direction. That's quite forward. OK, next one. So um, if you want to see how this is working, uh, here in the shelter it's a little bit hard, uh, you, can, you can visit us. The moon bounce uh, thing is at uh, the Leibandville over there. It's uh, next to Baikonur with the red pylon in, you see it most in the night, but you just look up where the big antennas are and ask for the moon bounce people and you'll find us. Uh, the satellite people are, are next to them with a blue bar, and uh, maybe you see us some, sometime in the evening uh, standing on the street with some uh, weird things and with uh, dangerous uh, rods and uh, asking you to step back a little bit. That's the satellite people. Uh, and if you know, uh, if you want to know how to, uh, how such a satellite could be built, 
there is a, a lecture in the evening about Mursat, which I'm working uh, on in this project, and it's about building one of these uh, amateur radio satellites, in, in, in fact. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested, attend the lecture. It's at uh, 7 p.m., I think. Okay. Uh, one thing uh, we did not have on the, on the, on the uh, on slides is uh, all three of us were licensed not more than uh, two years ago. We are quite new in the amateur radio thing, and we were interested in because we want to do this radio stuff and how to do it, how to do it, how to get uh, a legal possibility for something like this. And we decided to make uh, uh, to make the, the the exam, and we are now doing this stuff. It's not hard. You can do it yourself if you if you if you think it's it's interesting. So just try it. It's no big deal. There are a lot of uh, nice people. Uh, helping you, and uh, amateur radio people are generally quite uh, nice and, and relaxed, yeah. Okay, so, hope, uh, it was interesting for you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, someone? <laughs> Would you like to come? But, but. Yeah, the link budget? The, the uh, yeah, the link budget, yeah. We, we, which is left over. You end up with, I, I didn't get the, 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 the question. You end up with uh, something like, this lecture is recorded and Mike? How many dB? He's asking about the link budget for EME. For <laughs> Hello? EME. Okay. Uh, we have this link budget. You end up with something like. Uh, 17. 17. 70 zeros. Uh, it, it didn't get the question. Uh, anyway. Uh, you end up with uh, something like minus 20 to minus 27 dBs. Uh, that's, that's how it's working, yeah? Other questions? Yeah? The microphone? Word. For satellites? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, there are some satellites who do digital communication, and you can get up to 9,600 bits per second. That's not very, uh, very much, but it's quite something for a do-it-yourself thing. Hmm? And to the moon, it's, it's much less. I think you have uh, like five bits per second, something in that range. It's just like a big, big, uh, uh, big distance. There's a question over there. Uh, in the amateur radio range, can we expect to to extend this uh, this data um, this, this data rate? And uh, the second question is: uh, um, Is it possible to do uh, a ground station uh, by myself? Can I can I, can I make my ground station without buying anything from uh, start companies? Can you tell me again? Uh, I didn't hear it from the from the monitors. No. So there is two questions. The, the, the first one is, uh, can we expect to extend the, the data rate uh, with satellites? Uh, because uh, in order to make a, a, new, a new system of communication, uh, I, hope, I think that we need to extend the data yep. rate. Okay. And the second question is, uh, in order to, uh, to build a system, uh, a ground station, um, is it possible to build the ground, the, the, the ground station by myself? Um, or need I, um, do I need to buy something from standard, um, okay. standard companies, or is it possible okay. to, to homebrew everything? Okay, the first question is uh, uh, increase the rate. It's, it's very ha hard. You, you have seen we, have, we are very, very limited, and it's hardly working, okay? So uh, increasing uh, the, the data rate about the moon, uh, above the moon is, is a very hard thing to do. You can do it. You can put more power on it. You can put more antennas. There are people uh, who have like uh, 
of 30 meter wide antenna arrays, and they have a lot of uh, antenna gain, and they, 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 they have uh, big power amplifiers, you can do it. Um, but moon bounce is nothing like, okay, it's the new uh, uh, replacement of, of GSM radio or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it's more a proof of concept and a, and a hobby uh, than, than a efficient uh, a data a transmission scheme. The other thing is, uh, you can get something like this uh, trans uh, um, transceiver, handheld transceiver, from something like there's a Chinese uh, copy of a Chinese copy of a um, known uh, type, and it's about uh, 35 euros. Uh, you can build some, something like this antenna with a budget of like 50 euros. So it's no big deal. Of course, you can throw more money on it, and if you buy something like this power amplifiers or this uh, low noise amplifiers and this all this, this uh, HF stuff, uh, of course you have to spend some money on it. But on the other side, you also spend some money on your like keyboard or on your computer or on, on your monitor. So it just depends on where your priority is. But it's, it's completely affordable. We all do it and we are not poor. Yeah? Or we, we don't get poor out of it. That, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, one, one more question. Or is, is the time up? I'm um, here for questions. I'm sorry. Hmm? You have more time? Um, yeah, okay. okay. We, have, we have some time. Yeah? Um, I have one question. Does it work? There's one question from the Audio Angel, and he asks, if you can reach satellites with low-power handhelds, is it possible to do a DDoS, a DOS attack against satellites? I didn't get the last thing. Is it possible to? Is it possible to ah. do a denial of service attack uh, of against satellites? Okay, okay. Um, I know, sorry about this. It's like uh, in the ninth, beginning of the 1990s, there were people um, trying to hijack um, television uh, satellites. And they succeeded. They just put a big dish somewhere in a country where you are not prosecuted for, or very fast prosecuted for things like that. And they pointed this uh, dish to a, to a satellite, uh, to a, 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 um, a television satellite, and for some minutes they were able to um, to um, be stronger than the original signal of the of the uplink station. Uh, that's something that's very hard to mitigate on satellites. You have uh, a shared um, medium, and in a shared medium um, you have to cope. There is no enforcement of it. Um, Amateur radio satellites can, of, of course, be denied of service, but uh, what's the point? So who's interested in jamming uh, um, something that's for hobbyists? Uh, if you want to do it with uh, some, some professional uh, communication satellite, okay, maybe you have some agenda or some, something, something behind. But yeah, it's possible. Can't do very much about it. What they did uh, with the television satellite, uh, they found out that they were jammed. They uh, um, turned up the volume or the power, and the thing was over. Yeah, it's just like that. The stronger one wins, and yeah, that's the that's the thing. My question is about ground networks. You said that you're using the handhelds and Yagi antennas, but some persons you might know from the other side of the Atlantic, they are interested in acquiring old abandoned military dishes because they make a much better station for moon bounds. So I'm wondering how the acquiring old abandoned dishes situation looks like in this side of the Atlantic. It was very hard to understand. <laughs> um, old abundant dishes. Um, can you reuse them, I think, was no. the question. No. Tell, tell no. This is already, they're already in use from in the other side of the Atlantic, that is in the USA. So I'm just wondering, is there are similar activities in the European side as well to acquire old abandoned military dishes to okay. Communi okay. communicate with satellites? Uh, there, are, there is surplus uh, equipment you can get even here in Europe. It's no, no, no. These are like the dish stations, the complete dish station that was built to communicate with military satellites, but they abandoned it when the Soviets went back from the eastern part of Europe. I don't understand it because the, 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 the sound is going in front. I just right. say it again to me. <laughs> when the Soviets left the Eastern Europe, yeah. they left many of their military bases. Okay. These military bases are like really completely furnished yeah. with their dishes. Yeah. Okay. The same things are taken in the United States for bone bones. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know, but what I, I, I know is uh, in Bochum, there's an amateur radio station. 
Uh, it was a, a scientific amateur radio station. It's a 20 meter uh, dish, and uh, it was abandoned, and they took it over. Now it's a museum, and people are very happy that they care for it, and it's a, a great thing. Thing they want to uh, use this as a, a antenna for a Mars mission, a satellite that goes to Mars. So. And uh, they also had a proof of concept. Uh, they sent a ping to Venus and got it back again. So, yeah. Maybe you find some of these uh, old uh, Russian uh, stations, and maybe you, uh, you can um, 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 bring someone to, to sell it to you. I don't know. Uh, I not, have not heard of, about it, but maybe, yeah. A good example of using the existing military technology for civilian use. So that's something I'm yeah. interested be in. Be creative. Right. Be creative. Do it. It should do the, the, the job. Okay. One more question. Um, I don't know if this is true in Europe, but in the United States, it used to be very common for people to have very large television antennas uh, for satellite television, like uh, C-band, uh, four gigahertz. Um, this is no longer very widespread, at least in the United States, everyone's using digital television on, you know, little tiny dishes. Um, I wonder if there's any extra capacity on these old uh, television satellites, or are they being used for other things? Is okay. there a possibility to reuse some of the old C-band equipment for uh, internet or other data communications? Okay. Um, there are two parts of the antenna. The one is the dish and the uh, thing to turn it, okay? And the other one is the feed, where you actually get the, the waves into the cable. So you can change the feed, and the, the dish is still the same. It's just a parabolic uh, uh, surface. So uh, you can, you can change the, 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 the feed, and you have a, have a completely working dish. Uh, working... The, uh, I'm sorry, the, the question I have is the satellites. Okay. Are the existing satellites for uh, uh, three, four gigahertz television, can they be reused? It, because there's a lot of satellites which are probably quite old from the yep. 1980s uh, that may have capacity. Is there a yep. possibility of reusing existing commercial satellites which may or maybe are not being fully utilized anymore? Okay. Uh, are you aware of any? Uh, um, I'm not aware of it. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, geostationary satellites usually uh, run out of fuel and uh, cannot be reliably controlled. That's why they have to, to be put out of service. So if you find a satellite with uh, enough fuel to control it and to remove it afterwards, that's also very important, maybe you can use something like this. Uh, I've heard of a satellite project where uh, a communication satellite, which uh, kind of makes GSM via satellite, um, the, uh, was built and was uh, put up into space, and the company went bankrupt. Uh, and uh, there was an initiative to, uh, to raise money to buy this satellite and to move it somewhere over a development country to provide service there. Something like that could be, could be feasible. Yeah? But I'm, I'm not aware of something like this. It's an interesting idea, yeah? but, but I can't, can't say um, more, more than this. Okay. Yeah. I think there are no more questions. I think there are no more questions, no. Questions? Great. Okay.